Hello again, folks. It's part four of Tank Week, and we are off to the Eastern Front today to talk about Soviet tank development. I hope you've been with us for the previous shows, British tanks, tank machine guns. And this last night, we talked about German armor in Normandy. And then tomorrow, we've got one more show with Philip Brazier about the 79th Armor Division in the Scheldt Estuary. But tonight, we're going to be talking about Soviet armor developments. Um, and we have a return guest to World War II TV. Dr. Pritt Brutal was a big success when he was on in February talking about the development of the Red Army. Now we're being a bit, a little bit more specific, and we're talking about the development of armor specifically. So, um, um, good evening, Pritt. How are you doing? Good evening. I'm very well indeed, thank you. As you can see, lovely sunny evening here in, in uh, yeah, it's lovely sunny here too. So, um, we'll 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 kick right off. Um, the Soviets were reasonably late getting into the armor game compared to Britain and Germany. You know, the First World War, they kind of they they obviously saw what was happening elsewhere, but it's the twenties before they begin to develop tank uh, tank warfare, and they they are a little bit lagging behind initially, possibly. But by World War Two, or in the approach to World War Two, what has been happening with regards to sort of tank design generally? Has it been getting a lot of budget? Is it secondary to you know other aspects of Russian military? How are they how are they kind of perceiving it? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and, and to an extent, it reflects the fact that um, Imperial Russia had no automobile industry, so they had no real tradition of manufacturing you know, mechanized vehicles. They had a number of armored cars in the First World War, which were provided mainly by Britain, um, and they used these with mixed results. Um, and even their early tanks were largely copied from um, British and French designs um, whilst they developed their, their theory uh, about how to use them. And they did this at a tremendous rate. One, one thing that isn't widely known is that um, more articles were written by Soviet uh, military writers about future warfare and particularly mechanized warfare than any other nationality with the, with the one exception of Germany. Um, so they, they produced far more in writing than the British, the Americans, the French, etc. And they devised this whole concept of deep battle where uh, tanks would be used first of all, to break the enemy's front line, to get away from the awful trench warfare that they had experienced themselves and, of course, the West had experienced in France. Um, once the, the line had been broken, mechanized forces using lighter tanks would exploit into the full depth of the enemy position. And the idea was to conduct the battle in depth over, over um, a, you know, potentially over 80 or, or 100 kilometers. Um, and of course, that posed enormous logistic challenges as much as anything else. Um, like every army, they went into this with uh, vehicles that had been designed, if you like, in theory on what they thought would be needed. And as with pretty much every war in history, unless you have recently fought a conflict using that kit, there, there's usually quite a rude shock when you realize that it's not really suited to purpose. So if we start with the um, concept of heavy armor designed to penetrate the front line, um, the Russians came up with these, this fairly unique idea. I think the French did this too very, very briefly, but nowhere near to the same extent as the Russians of if you're going to build a tank, you build it like a little battleship with more than one turret and with different weapons. Um, the T-28 um, started to appear in the early 1930s. Um, it was about 28 tons. So by the, the standards of what followed, it wasn't a particularly enormous tank. But by 1932 uh, standards, this is a heavyweight, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It fielded a 76 mil gun, in fact, very similar to the gun that went on uh, to arm the KV-1 and the uh, T-34. It had a total of four machine guns. Um, and its armor was, yeah, pretty unremarkable for that era, uh, between 20 and 40 millimeters, designed largely to stop small arms fire and light artillery fire. And these things were meant to smash through the trench line, assist the infantry in breaking through, and then hand over to the exploit exploitation forces. Um, the T-28 was followed very shortly after by the T-35, <coughs> Pardon me, which was an attempt to address some of the weaknesses that had been found with the T-28. And here you have a proper little land battleship. Um, it has a 76 mil gun and then two separate turrets with 45 mil guns and 
in some versions, up to six machine guns. Um, extraordinary little vehicle. Uh, again, uh, this was much, much bigger, though. I, sh I shouldn't really call it a little vehicle. This one weighed, weighed in at 45 tonnes, which for that era made it an absolute behemoth. You know? Yeah, that photo there with a the, with the, with the human being on it for scale is really, yeah. really gets across the enormity of it. I mean, it's, to me, it looks like how a little child would draw. If you said, draw a ship for land, that's how you draw it. <laughs> Just completely out of a kid's imagination. And curiously, when you see some of the doodles that uh, Ferdinand Porsche came up with for land monitors, they, they do look remarkably similar. Um, this was actually less well armoured than its predecessor. Most of the weight went to, into all of these extra turrets and the machinery required for them. Um, about 400 T-28s were built, uh, fewer than 100 T-35s were built. And by the beginning of the Second World War, these things were completely obsolete. Um, most of them were lost very early on in the fighting. Um, in fact, the great majority of them were lost either to breakdown or just becoming stranded on broken bridges or, or collapsed roadways. Um, they were hugely popular um, as objects for German soldiers to pose on for photographs, because most German soldiers had never seen anything um, on the scale of, of one of these monsters, you know. Um, but the, the Soviets themselves realized that perhaps this was a failed experiment and that they had to go in a different direction. Um, and the first of their, if you like, sort of semi-modern tanks was the KV-1, uh, which was, uh, designed under the auspices of Clement uh, Voroshilov, who was one of Stalin's mates from the Civil War era. Um, they abandoned the multi-turret design in order to devote more of the weight uh, to armour. So this is getting back to this um, well-trodden concept of a tank being a balance between protection, firepower and mobility. And they decided that the additional firepower from multiple turrets was not really particularly beneficial and you needed better armor. So this thing, again, weighed about um, 45 tons, similar to the uh, Monster T-35, um, but it had far better armor, uh, 75 mils minimum on the sides of the hull and 90 mils on the front, and the front of the turret was even thicker. Um, it had the 76 mil gun, which was by now well um, respected and capable of killing pretty much anything it was going to come up against. And different versions had different numbers of machine guns, but a minimum of three machine guns. Um, it started entering service in 1940. Uh, there were reports of a few of these being used in the winter war against Finland, but actually they, there weren't any KV-1s deployed there as far as I'm aware. It, it was a tank, as with many tanks, it had its downsides. Um, drivers in particular hated this thing. Uh, the gearbox was phenomenally heavy, and it was commonplace for tank drivers um, to, uh, to go into action uh, with a small uh, metal hammer because the gearbox would often just get stuck, and the only way to free it was to, to bash away at it in order to change gear. Um, it was expensive to produce compared to... Uh, the tanks that followed. Um, but nevertheless, it was almost indestructible in 1941. The only German gun that had any real chance of killing it was, of course, the 88mm anti-aircraft uh, anti gun in the ground roll. Certainly the standard armament of um, uh, Panzerjäger battalions really had no chance at all against this. Um, and Rouse, in his memoirs, describes an episode where one of these survived about 18, hour, 18 or 24 hours of action after it had been stranded, just fighting off every German attack um, uh, against it. So very, very um, good tank defensively, pretty good gun, mechanically not so hot. Um, production of this was disrupted, of course, in 1941 when everything started being shipped um, off to the Urals. Um, but nevertheless, very effective tank. And it then gave birth to a true monster, the KV-2, which I remember when I first saw a picture of this thing, 
um, as a schoolboy, just wondering what on earth was this thing? I mean, can you imagine the German infantry suddenly being confronted by this monstrous vehicle? It's the same chassis. It has this huge turret mounting a 152 mil howitzer. And this is a return to the concept of a breakthrough tank. This thing is designed to go up against bunkers and hardened defense lines and just overwhelm them with its firepower. So if you like, this is mobile, well-protected artillery. Um, a number so just of you, just to, just to clarify a couple of things, Prit. I'm just checking yeah. what we've got coming in on YouTube as well. Um, Soviets, uh, diesel or petrol for their for their tanks at this point? Generally, they went for diesel um, because they had, they had good diesel engines, and you can make a good argument that had uh, German industry had decent diesels, they might have gone for those rather than the petroleum powered tanks uh, that they gen that they almost exclusively deployed. Um, certainly by the end of the Second World War, I remember reading, uh, I think, about 4th Panzer Division, where there was diesel fuel available for the trucks, but very, very little petroleum left for anything. Mm. You know? So there were also lots of benefits in diesel. And of course, you know, uh, wait for weight a diesel engine um, will actually give you better uh, power than a petrol engine. In this, uh, maybe uh, more forgiving in different climates as well, possibly. Exactly. And, and well. possibly, yeah. And the lower maintenance costs in, in, in the Soviet Union would have been yeah. huge. So the next thing I want to say, I'll, I'll let you carry on in a minute, is to, to reference back what Gareth was saying on Monday with the British Army. First point is the Russians have got 76 millimeter guns when the British are still on two pounders. So, so there's there's a clear uh, firepower adv uh, uh, advantage with the Soviets at this point. Um, have they? How are they getting on with their whole kind of combined arms thing? Because as Gareth was talking about on Monday, the British. It's getting better by 1939, but the 1930s, they're still not sure about whether it's cavalry, whether it's supporting the infantry, whether it's support armor. Um, this this idea of the the deep warfare that you're talking about is is everybody singing to that same hymn sheet? Is, is are they all? Get, is there kind of rival schemes of what should be happening with armor in in Russia at this point? Yeah, there's huge rivalry inevitably, and there's a lot of reactionism because. Uh, people like uh, Budioni, another of Stalin's uh, buddies from the old days, a uh, renowned cavalry general, um, absolutely de determined that cavalry would play a, a big part in future warfare. Um, so, you know, the, the, there, there was all of this problem. And the, uh, you know, the Red Army ha was the first to um, experiment with large numbers of airborne forces, too, mm. uh, or mobile operations. They were doing a lot of experiments with this, but you know, it's one thing to do it in um, in a, a field exercise. It's quite another when you have an enemy who's going to react in unpredictable ways. So, um, and of course, all of this preparation for um, the whole concept of of deep battle was completely sidelined by Stalin's purges, which eliminated such a large tranche of officers. You then had. Uh, political reliability becoming much more important than theoretical military mm, practical mm. experience. So by the time you get to 1939, the Red Army is in pretty poor shape when it comes to doctrine. Um, the, the deep battle concept is still pretty good, but it has now become subordinated to political obedience and reliability. Mm. Uh, so the, these were the heavyweight tanks, um, but now we go on to the lighter tanks. Um, these were the, meant to be the exploitation vehicles. So this was the T-26 based on the Vickers Mark E, um, and it was uh, produced in prodigious quantities. Uh, over 10,000 had been built by September 1939, and production continued for another couple of years. Um, it weighed slightly under 10 tons. It only had about 20 mils of uh, armor. Um, but again, it was designed as an ex This was, if you like, a cavalry tank. It was going to exploit into the depths of the enemy position. So you're going to be going up against rear area uh, formations. You're going to be going against supply lines, headquarters. You don't necessarily need that heavy armor if that sort of concept of armored warfare is going to work. Um, the Red Army had... Uh, had almost standardized on the 45 millimeter gun as its standard, um, if medium, anti-tank weapon, if you like. So the same gun was deployed in towed form as was uh, employed in this vehicle. Um, but even by the Winter War of 39, this thing was pretty obsolete. Um, 
anti-tank rifles, which were in widespread use um, in East European nations, could punch through the armor of this thing quite easily, uh, making it quite vulnerable. Uh, so even by the outbreak of the Second World War, it had been decided this thing was largely useless. It was easily the most numerous Soviet tank at the beginning of Barbarossa, um, but over 50% of the tank fleet was immobile because of spare parts shortages and, and mechanical issues. And a large number of these tanks were just destroyed uh, or left abandoned uh, rather as the Red Army retreated because they had no means of, of moving them. In any case, um, they were largely obsolete. The Germans did use some of them as gun tractors and as gun carriages um, simply because, you know, if you capture over 5,000 uh, perfectly workable vehicles, it's crazy not to put them to some sort of mm -hmm. use. Yeah. And just we're monitoring a question, Scott Grimwood is asking um, about the uh, the tractor production, you know, Stalin's industrialization. Did it give the, the Soviets a bit of a head start in this regard, in just in terms of, of getting things made? Well, all of the tractor factories were producing tanks. Um, so whether it was Kharkov or uh, Leningrad or Stalingrad or Moscow, they were all, um, whatever else they were making, they also made tanks. The interesting thing is that there, even within the Red Army, there was recognition of enormous variability in quality. And tanks produced in Kharkov and Stalingrad were particularly valued. They tended to be better made than the ones from Leningrad and Moscow. Um, so when um, the factory started uh, being shipped off to the Urals and uh, eventually around the city of Chelyabinsk at the southern end of the Urals, um, they developed what became known as Tankograd, uh, where all of these plants were set up. Um, Again, there was huge variability in quality and some of the tests that were done on Soviet armor by both the Germans and by the Americans, um, they found that the quality of armor, even on an individual tank, varied. So a shot, might, you know, so the, the hardness of the frontal armor of, let us say, a T-34 might be slightly weaker on one side than the other, um, just purely arbitrarily because of the quality of alloys uh, that were being used. Wow, that's that's interesting. That suggests that there's a the recentness of the of the German industrial uh, sorry Russian industrialization is kind of this weakness of mixing up your your, your metals and your ore and uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's um, yeah. and, and they were still you know, I guess because if you don't have the tradition of automotive industry where you're building large numbers of cars for a consumer market, that sort of quality control kind of gets lost somewhere along the way, you know, with a command economy, the factory is just going to make X thousand tractors and the actual quality or, or variability of quality becomes much less of a consideration, you know. Um, the, the Russians also had this uh, whole class of tanks called the BT tanks. Um, uh, BT stands for fast tank or Bistrochodny tank. Um, the BT-7 um, was the main one at the start of the Second World War. Uh, just under a thousand of these were built, 14 and a half tons, about 22 mil armor at the thickest. And again, the same 45 mil gun that we've already talked about. And these were meant to be fast tanks. These were meant to be amphibious. Um, this was the exploitation force that was going to penetrate far into the depths of the position. And more forward looking Soviet commanders would have seen these as, if you like, this is what the cavalry will become. You know, the, um, this is going to be our, our exploitation arm. Um, Interestingly, um, people of my generation in NATO will remember the BT-76 uh, from uh, the Cold War era, which was uh, the ultimate descendant of the BT line, and it was uh, an amphibious tank. Um, a, a crazy vehicle, um, the uh, BT-76, it was about the size, nearly the size of a chieftain tank, um, except it was uh, meant to be a light tank. Um, but as I say, the, the the, so the Soviet Union went into the Second World War prepared for this theoretical form of, uh, of conflict, um, which they hadn't really had a chance to try out for real. Um, of course, the tank that we're all waiting to hear about is the T-34. Yeah, uh, just, just, just before we do that, Prit, just there's already two or three people chatting in the chat there about suspension, Christie suspension, yes. because, you know, you said earlier that there's a lot of kind of British influence with the initial Soviet designs. As they start coming into their own, they start, you know, have had the winter war and things are developing. 
when do they start bringing their own ideas about suspension in and what what are their kind of um, breakthroughs in this regard? Well, they did adopt the Christie suspension quite early on in their tank design. Um, the There was a mixture of good and bad in, in that sort of sense. They did innovate quite well and they, because of their experiences, particularly in the hugely varied terrain of the Soviet Union, they were much more conscious perhaps than uh, Western tank designers of the impact of terrain on the mobility of a tank. So pretty much every mm. Soviet tank from the mid-30s onwards is specifically designed to be able to cope with muddy conditions, with snowy conditions, and with perfectly dry conditions. And one of the criticisms that um, Soviet tank crews repeatedly made of Lend-Lease tanks was, so for example, the Matilda, they said they hated it because it couldn't cope with mud. They said that the running gear just got got jammed up uh, in muddy conditions. Um, whereas the average Soviet tank, the suspension might not have been as good, it may have been a very uncomfortable the vehicle, but it's going to work pretty much anywhere in the Soviet Union. And that's interesting because when we did with Gareth on Monday, the the primary location where the British are playing around with tanks <laughs> in is Salisbury Plain. So chalk, not a lot of mud. So it's, I, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but the Matilda may have been performing perfectly going across all those fields and over those da down there in Salisbury. But yeah, as you say, get it into somewhere like the... The Russia with the mud and suddenly it's a different prospect so yeah. it's interesting that it ties back that show on Monday about where you use them and I guess Russian factories are spread out over a such an enormous part of the country over such enormous enormous terrain differences temperature differences uh, that I guess that they're, they're they're able to experience them in much uh, a much greater variety of, um, of conditions which is all going to help get that as close yeah. as you can to the perfect tank, of which there is no perfect tank, but closer to get you can get the better. Yeah, and of course, you know, in the entire Soviet Union, whether you're up in Leningrad or whether you're way down south in Stalingrad, you're going to have dry periods, you're going to have two seasons of the year when everything turns to mud, and you're going to have very, very cold and snowy weather. So they're going to experience that full range pretty much wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you get into... Uh, um, in, in you know, uh, away from the big cities, there's plenty of swampy conditions where tank designers can test their kit out to see how well it copes. So this is the tank that allegedly took the Germans so much by surprise, and you kind of left wondering what the Germans were doing that they hadn't noticed this thing being developed, um, because the Red Army had actually deployed it at Kalkin Gol against the Japanese. Um, so it had actually seen action um, before Barbarossa. It really shouldn't have taken the Germans by surprise, and yet manifestly it did. Um, in my my next book, which will be out in next year, I've written quite a bit about the failures of German military intelligence at every level. And this is just another example. They just didn't spot this thing at all. Curiously, there was a an incident um, before the uh, beginning of the Second World War when um, Guderian showed uh, a visiting group of Soviet officers around a German tank factory. And when they saw Panzer IVs being built, um, they asked him, yeah, but show us your proper heavy tanks. And he said, this is our heavy tank. And they flatly refused to believe him, which kind of should have been a clue that they had something better and, and bigger, um, you know, of their own. So mm. this is the T-34. Um, we could have done a whole program just on this and on its development. Um, it actually entered service in 1940. Um, ultimately, the number produced just became staggering. Over 80,000 were, were, were built. Um, and production continued in Czechoslovakia until 1958. So it, it was in production for a very long time. It has the dubious distinction of being the most knocked out tank in history, um, which given the sheer number that were produced is really no surprise, I guess. Mm. Um, 27 tons, armor that varied from 40 to 60 millimeters, but it was the first tank to make extensive use of sloping armor, which has the advantage, firstly, of deflecting uh, incoming rounds. You can use their kinetic energy and momentum uh, to, so that hopefully some of them will bounce off. And also penetrating um, 
armor obliquely, you're effectively going through a greater thickness. Yeah. So that improves um, the protection for the crew. It had the same 76 mil gun as the KV-1, which kind of made the KV-1 of questionable value because why are you um, having? Why are you building a tank that is heavier and slower than this, but it doesn't have any better firepower? Okay, it has better protection, but the downside of that is it also breaks bridges and wrecks roads as it goes, and it's slower than the T-34. If you're going to have a bigger tank, maybe you need a bigger gun on it. Um, but it did have its weaknesses. Um, very few Russian tanks um, or Soviet tanks in 1941 were equipped with radios. It wasn't commonplace for them to have radios. And again, this is entirely consistent and reasonable if you go with the doctrine. So if the doctrine is you're going to use medium and heavy tanks to smash up the enemy's front line, OK, fine. There's a degree of re uh, coordination required, but that's with the accompanying infantry, not necessarily from one tank to another. When it comes to exploitation, once you've broken through and you're running amok in the rear areas, again, you don't really need radios between tanks. You should just have a radio for the commander's tank, and then he can communicate. And the, and the Red Army um, protocols call for communication between tanks within a unit to be done by the, um, the company commander waving flags out of his turret. Um, and again, that might have worked well in a, in a field exercise, but when you're buttoned down and you're under fire, the last thing anyone wants to do is open their turret and wave flags out of it. And even more so, no one's really going to be looking to see what colour flag he's waving and which way he's pointing mm -hmm. it. So the coordination of, of these things was hopeless. And um, Herman Balk in his memoirs said that one of the the best innovations of German tank design was the insistence of not only a radio in every tank, but a radio operator. Um, in that this this acted as a great force multiplier and and made the whole Panzer arm into a much more lethal weapon. Mm. Um, so yeah, great tank, and and in the compromise between mobility, um, armor, and firepower, it pretty much ticks all the boxes. But it did have weaknesses. Um, Right the way through its production run, uh, slightly inexplicably, it was plagued by um, the metal pins used um, for the track links being quite soft, and these would break quite easily. Um, it wasn't possible, for example, to take a, a reasonably tight bend um, at full speed. If you did that, you were going to break a track and you are going to shed a track. And of course, the German armour realised th uh, this very quickly. The Panzerjägers would routinely deploy near, near a bend in a road, knowing that either a tank was going to shed a track and it would be a sitting duck, or it was going to have to slow down to take the bend. Um, and as with all um, Second World War era armour, uh, the, the gun sights, the optics were nowhere near as good as the German ones, which kind of let them down. Um, but nevertheless, um, when it appeared, there was really nothing that the Germans had uh, that could, could go up against it um, on a one to one basis. The long barreled Panzer IVs could just about cope with it. But at the sort of range where they started becoming effective against it, they were pretty much um, easy meat for its 76 mil gun too. So it wasn't a particularly uh, good trade. And of course, this triggered the whole development of the Panther um, uh, and its rather prolonged gestation. In fact, the early versions of the Panther looked astonishingly similar to t mm. And there was a, even a proposal of why don't we just build something that's as close to the T-34 as we can. But I believe Hitler himself uh, vetoed that. Um, and and two, two points I want to just jump in. One, one earlier you said about the Germans' intelligence of Soviet vehicle design not being good enough. Can some of that be put down to the fact that they just don't believe the Soviets are capable of thinking very cleverly because of this whole, you know, sub subspecies, you know, they, 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 it's racism. You know, they, why on earth would the Soviets be doing anything better than us? Is, is that an element of it as well, do you think? It's very hard to say, isn't it? I, I think it, I think it's quite possible, and I think certainly there was always a tendency to dismiss it. And, and some of this is rooted in German experiences from the First World War, where uh, after Tannenberg and the fighting at the Missourian Lakes and the campaigns that followed, the Germans had a pretty low opinion of of the Russian army. They felt that the sure. soldiers themselves yeah. were very tough and were hardy and could put up with a great deal of privation, but they didn't really rate their officers. Um, and they felt that 
on a unit for unit level, they could knock over a Russian force at any time. So if you think that most of the officers by the time you get to the Second World War are people who had at least some First World War experience, those those old beliefs and prejudices can, get carried forward. Mm. And then if you have um, the appalling um, performance of uh, Fremde Hira Ost, the, the intelligence arm uh, responsible for investigating um, you know, the uh, enemies in the East. Yeah, if, if, if they're reporting, oh, that these guys are pretty useless. Um, yeah, you have all sorts of reasons why um, field officers are going to uh, think, yeah, that's probably probably true. And that fits with our, our mm. understanding of it too. And the second thing just to, 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 is that we, we talked about this before we went online earlier, the, the the additions to the T thirty four they did look at things there was there were comments coming back from the field I want you to talk a little bit about the the, the handles the ability the, this this cooperation yes. with infantry um, yes. and you can see it on the photo there how many grab handles there are so this, this sort of kind, of kind of comes out from from experience in the field is that right very much so and one of the the great tank commanders of the Red Army was Pavel Rodmistrov um, who kind of failed as a field commander. Um, ultimately, he was sacked after um, Fifth Guard's tank army got caught up in urban warfare at the tail end of Bagration. And for, uh, I think, the fourth time in less than 18 months, um, his tank army lost nearly all of its tank complement. Um, so he was then put in another role in which actually he was far better. He was a much better, he was much better in an administrative role and a development role. And in mid-1942, he had a meeting with um, uh, Stalin where he said, uh, the lack of radios is killing us. We need radios. Um, it's it's one thing to say we want infantry to accompany tanks into battle, but unless you put handles on the tanks, the infantry are going to fall off at the first ditch you try to cross. Um, and it's a simple enough thing to do just to weld some handles to the outside. So by the time you get to um, uh, Uranus and the encirclement of Sixth Army of Stalingrad, this is now standard. All of the T-34s have handles, a lot more of them have radios, and, and this is now becoming largely the way ahead. Um, uh, both uh, Rotmistrov and Katukov, another um, tank commander, said, actually, the, the tank mix we have is wrong. The KV-1s, he said, frankly, in a battle, they're not particularly useful. Um, yes, they're indestructible, but when we go into action, they're slow, so they don't get there first. It's usually the, the light tanks that get there. They don't have the firepower to hold their own, so they, they take losses. The T-34s then turn up and do the stuff that needs to be done. Meanwhile, the KV-1s are trundling along in the background, breaking every bridge they cross, chewing up every road that they they traverse, and that means that the support arms get held up. They can't follow. And he was saying, look, you know, we just want to standardise. We want a light tank and we want a, a lot of T-34s, and let's just go with that and improve the quality of what we have. If ever you get the chance to climb onto a T-34, and there are plenty of them around in um, parts of Europe in memorials and things, if ever you get a chance to have a close look at them, it's a fascinating experience. I think I could probably do a better job of welding than some of the welding I've seen on T-34s. You know, I guess it's difficult to build 85,000 of anything at that sort of speed it's funny you should say that because I, I i drove a t34 years and years ago in somewhere in essex there was some kind of photo shoot and my dad i think took me there or came with me and the first thing he did is look at the welding and was like, yeah. <laughs> just a uh, interesting comment there um just to, sorry to interrupt you again there but another thing that i think when we talk about soviet tank design and indeed german tank design and you th i think of those wonderful websites like tank encyclopedia is both of those nations are going for lots and lots of prototypes and i think one of the the, the advantages of sticking with something like the t-34 is kind of you've got something that's pretty damn good just keep working on improving that design little by little because if you end up going for something new you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. and when you look at those tank sites the germans and russians the germans particularly lots and lots of effort being put into prototype prototypes that never really get off the ground but they make 20 of them and you think about all that resource all that technology all those boffins standing over that stuff you think why aren't they just standing around the T-34, for example, and improving that? But that is, I think it's saying about designers. Designers always want to do, there's always that, I want to be designed a new thing. Yeah. It's, um, so it's actually, you know, it's one yeah. of the comments. 
No, absolutely. And there's a little nuance on that in that the great majority of evolutionary design on a T-34 made no practical difference from a maintenance point of view in that um, it's fixing a tank that has infantry handles on the outside is exactly the same as fixing a tank that doesn't. Um, yeah. They, they reserved their more substantial changes for when they upgunned it to the T-3485, um, which meant that until then, a T-34 was a T-34, you know, whereas ultimately Panzer IV had reached Ausführung H, you know, they, they were just endless variants with often very little, um, you know, compatibility in, in certain parts of the tank between one version and the next. Um, whereas these things were just effortlessly easy to maintain. You could just, yeah, yeah keep them going with, uh, with fairly modest uh, equipment, which was very important because the engineering and, and workshop support for Soviet armor was very poor by Western standards and by German standards. And throughout the war, the thing that you see evolving all the time is more and more effort being put into tank recovery, tank repair, because they're getting the eye, they're realizing that so many tanks are lost due to breakdown or modest damage. And if you can just patch this stuff up on the battlefield, you can keep your armored forces at combat strength for a lot longer. Um, yeah, we had that this with Arthur a few weeks ago, talking about the Canadian Army and their and their um, kind of um, triage system of identifying tanks could be repaired within a few, you know, two days or a week, and uh, and you know it makes sense. You've spent a lot of money on something, keep it going rather than buying a new one. It's uh, it's it, it, it makes perfect sense. But let's we're going to move on as well. We've got lots more tanks to talk about, so um, we're going to come up with the so the, the eighty five. Yeah, so by the time you get to 1943 and you have Tiger tanks um, making a nuisance of themselves, out of all proportion to the fairly modest numbers that were deployed, it must be said. Um, and also, you know, uh, after Kursk, you have the Panther turning up. The, the Red Army started looking at upgunning its tanks because it didn't really have anything that go, could deal with a Tiger. Um, we talked briefly before we went on air about sloping armour and... By the time you get to Kursk, it was standard operating procedure for um, Tiger tanks when they went into action um, to engage the enemy by firing over one of the front corners. Um, the result of this was that incoming fire would then hit the frontal or side armor obliquely rather than at right angles. So even though a Tiger has fairly slab vertical sides, this effectively turns it into sloping armor. Um, which turns an already well-armoured tank into something a bit like the KV-1 was uh, for the Germans. It's very difficult for the Red Army to kill it. Um, they had this 85 mil gun, which was by now recognised as a very potent weapon, um, and it was a matter of how are we going to mount this on a tank. Um, the KV-85 was the old KV-1 chassis with a new turret um, and this larger uh, gun mounted on it. Um, and... Unfortunately, because the, the, there, was, there was so much demand for the 85 mil gun, both on vehicles and as a, a towed weapon, the, amount, the number that could be provided for the production of these tanks was fairly modest. As a result, only um, a, a, a fewer than 200, fewer than 150, in fact, were built. Um, it was a big tank. It was 46 tons. Uh, its armor was up to 160 mils, which makes it pretty indestructible um, if, if it's uh, attacked from the wrong side. Um, and of course it had this 85 mil gun, which at ranges of up to about a kilometer um, had a reasonable chance of killing a tiger or a panther, even against a panther's frontal armor. Um, and whilst as time went by, um, yes, Certainly after the war, the British started looking at tank guns that could engage targets at ridiculous ranges of up to four or five kilometers. The general belief on the, on the Eastern Front was there's so, there are so few occasions when you're going to be engaging people at anything more than about a kilometer range. But that's perfectly effective. So long as you can kill what you need to kill at that range, that will do. So this was, if you like, an interim tank, and it didn't really uh, get produced in very large numbers. Um, and it was then replaced by the Josef Stalin series, um, the first of which, the, the IS-1, um, had the same 85 mil gun as this. Um, and it was then replaced by the IS-2, uh, because there was no point, because by then the T-34 had been upgunned to having an 85 mil gun with a bigger turret. So there was no point in the heavy tank having the same gun. So they said, well, we'll give it this new um, 
uh, gun which is uh, more powerful. They gave it a 122 mil gun. But actually, because of the, the design of the gun, it had a lower muzzle velocity, which made it was meant it was less penetrative than the 85 mil gun. And also, these tanks only carried 28 rounds into combat, which meant that they weren't up to um, prolonged action, um, and, and that greatly limited their usefulness. And whilst, you know, um, some of the German accounts talk of these, gun, these tanks as having an outrageously big gun, etc., their main use was actually in suppressing infantry defences and bunkers. Um, these these things could just smash up anything with that big gun and then just grind it into the dirt with their tracks. But the running gear of this is still pretty much the same as the old KV-1. And this continues through the whole of the IS range of tanks, all the way up to even when you get to the Cold War era T-10. Um, a lot of the running gear looks remarkably similar to the old um, KV design. But over 4,000 of the IS-2s were built. Um, ultimately, an IS-3 was produced. It didn't quite get around to getting into combat um, before the end of the war. Um, only 350 had been built by the end of hostilities. It had an improved armor design with a more, um, this was what we would all become familiar with in the Cold War, the, the big turtle shell turret um, going away from these slab sided uh, turrets. But this was, if you like, the, the pinnacle of Soviet heavy tank design in the Second World War, the IS-2. Um, this saw action at Cherkasy and the battles that followed. And the Germans didn't like it, not because their 122 gun was a particularly lethal weapon, but because they were just so hard to kill. They, you know, the, the armor on these was so tough. Um, so just a, another question that came in um, from the Great Dominion there is that we were talking about you were talking about radios in tanks, but uh, and a good question. Um, what about intercoms within the tanks? So you have the tank to tank communication. What about with inside the tank? Because the bigger the things get, the bigger the engines get, the noisier everything gets. So tell us about when the Russians start introducing that, if indeed they did. Well, again, they didn't have this at the outset. Um, and there are, you know, Soviet veterans' accounts are of, of shouted messages within the tank and the, the driver almost having to climb out of his seat to yell up into the turret to make his uh, uh, his comments heard to the tank commander. Um, yeah, they, they didn't really have those. They, they first really, their first experience of that was Lend-Lease tanks in 19, late 1941, early 42. Um, <laughs> Quite often, the, the the British tanks that arrived at that stage, um, the first thing that they did was they ripped the radios out because they they weren't really used to having them, and they thought, well, our tank crews uh, are four man, and we don't actually have a spare man for the radio. And more to the point, we don't have personnel who've been trained in the use of radios. But certainly, by the time you get into these heavyweight monsters, not only are they all um, radioed, but they also have intercoms, um, as you say, purely because. Um, communicating within a tank uh, is difficult at the best of times and when you have small arms fire and goodness knows what else clanging off the outside it becomes even harder um, and, and and quite often you know uh, you're relying on everybody being able to, to yeah. assist in spotting uh, uh, stuff that's happening on the outside world uh, in order to, to uh, avoid uh, being taken by surprise and, and we said before we went online we might end up talking a bit about the lend lease uh equipment and i'm just thinking maybe that now is the time to mention it because um it's not just about their use it's about seeing different technology when they started getting you know uh shermans or earlier than that the lees and the grants and things and they're thinking they're, they're obviously thinking that some of the, the british and american designs there's things that well, we're already better with that, but maybe there's other things they, they think, well, hang on, they're, they're, they, this is good. We can incorporate that. Did it did it give them an advantage? Did they take advantage of things they're learning from other nations? And again, they're, they're encountering a lot of German armor as well that they can capture stuff. Are they are they quick to pick up on, on what they can learn from their rivals and or allies? Well, indeed they are. And and whilst the um, it, it's natural for everyone to say, no, we invented this stuff ourselves, you know, there's no doubt that they copied other people's designs. Um, in fact, the, the Valentine tank particular, you know, we were talking earlier on about the different quality of tanks. The Russian uh, writers all comment on the variable quality of the Lend-Lease equipment they received. And they requested that um, the Valentine tank remain in production because they, they rather liked it. They felt it was a good compromise of, of 
sufficiently meaty tank for the weight that, that it was, and um, particularly with the poor quality roads and bridges over which the Red Army had to function. Um, but they stipulated they wanted the Canadian built ones. They preferred those to the British built ones, hmm. which is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing that they, well, yes, of course, they they, stood, they realized that the British intercoms and things were, were really rather smart. Um, they didn't really like Shermans because they thought they had a very high profile and were fairly easy to knock out. And of course, British and American tank crews also complained of that. Um, they found that they, they thought the Churchills were awfully fiddly and slow and cumbersome. But on the other hand, they loved the fact that they were bloody hard to kill and that they could yeah. just slug it out with the, the enemy. Um, but the the tank I would say, or the design that they copied most enthusiastically was the German concept of the Sturmgeschütz, and the idea of a fully tracked vehicle but no turret, and you mount a gun, you're mounting a gun with fairly limited traverse, um, but it allows you to mount a pretty big gun for that particular chassis. So this was. Um, uh, uh, the start of this, the SU-122, this was a T-34 uh, chassis with a howitzer put on it. And this was, again, designed to assist units in smashing their way through front lines. Um, a total of a little over 600 of these were built uh, up to mid-1943. Um, 31 tonner with fairly substantial armour, 45 mils of armour. Um, so it could stand its, uh, it could hold its place in the front line um, and it proved its value. Um, it had all the limitations of any assault gun, very limited turret traverse, which limited its usefulness. Um, but certainly, again, if you're, if you're using it in a deliberate attack where you're pointing it at the objective and then sending it trundling forward, that becomes less of a feature. It's relying on towed anti-tank guns and T-34s to look after its flanks and to kill off German armor that's sneaking up on it. Um, but this was... Um, this was around for a while. It was then replaced by the SU-85, which was equipped with this um, famous 85 mil gun. It was lighter, which was a benefit, uh, just a little lighter. And this was built in huge numbers. Um, over two and a half thousand of these were built. Um, but when the T-34 was upgunned and given a bigger turret so that it could carry an 85 mil gun, there was um, th there was if you like, competition for a limited supply of guns. So these things were upgunned to the SU-100, which had a 100 mil gun. Um, that increased the weight of it a little bit, but it also with that weight came uh, better armour. And uh, over two and a half thousand of these were built. And actually, these remained in service for a very long time. There were still units equipped with these you know, going well into the 1970s and 1980s um, because it was a very effective tank killer. Um, it had up to 75 mil armor, nicely sloped in order to defeat incoming ammunition. Um, and it was a very reliable vehicle um, and a very effective one. Um, I think to, to, to clarify again, it's all very well introducing the self-propelled guns, but you've got to have the doctrinal or the tactical yeah. approach behind it. Otherwise, it's pointless. And we, we know with the British and Americans, I know there's tank destroyers. We never kind of went down that self-propelled gun route we did a bit with the sexton and the priest i suppose we went for the artillery the mobile artillery as well so it but it's how how at this point sort of 43 44 are the russians changing their tactics because it's also now we're going from a defensive war to an to an attacking war are they keeping up to date with that as well because the technolo technological advances uh, uh, changes of tactics, yeah. changes of commanders. Um, how how are how are things progressing generally within within yeah. Soviet armor at this point? Yeah, well, the, the big downside of any self-propelled gun like this is it's very limited traverse, which means it becomes a bit of a liability in an encounter battle where you don't necessarily uh, come upon your enemy right in front of you. Um, con but they are. They're most valuable where they can take up a deliberate position, uh, either in a deliberate attack where you're just moving forward against a known target or else in a defensive position where you know where the enemy is going to come from. So they were used in considerable numbers um, in order to protect breakthroughs in, in anticipation of the expected German counterattack. Uh, they would then be deployed in, in very large numbers. And you have entire brigades equipped with these things uh, by the time you get into the second half of 1944. Um, so 
they provide a level of mobility that towed anti-tank guns don't have. They're, they're able to accompany the tank armies uh, in, in, into the depths of enemy positions and provide better protection for anti-tank crews. Um, and they're, yeah, they're, they're certainly proving their worth um, in that sort of tank destroyer and defensive role against German armor. Because, you know, right the way through to the Bundeswehr days, the German army still believed that the best use of a tank was as an attacking weapon, um, whether it's in a counterattack or, uh, or in a, uh, a fully fledged attack. And um, one of the features, as we've mentioned in my previous talk with you, was that by the time you get to 1944, the Red Army has learned how to neutralize that. And, and these played a big part in that. Um, mm. And, and that's, then, that's yeah. similar to when we were with Niels yesterday with the German armor in Normandy, is that they have quite a lot of Stugs and Marders but then yeah. they're trying to do things with Stugs and Marders that they're not really good at doing. They're, they're, they're pretty good in the ambush role, but then when you're trying to send them ahead, to try, by then the British and Americans have worked out if there's a Stug coming towards you, go around the side. You just So yeah. they're all very well, these things, if you use them in the correct environment. The minute they start going out into some different use, the, the weaknesses become become apparent, and it's that, that's the, that's it's, it's, all, it's all about the, um, the, the how they're being used at a, at a, in a greater level that becomes as interesting as actually the vehicles themselves it's the it's the tactical well, it, use behind them absolutely inevitably and of course you know the the wehrmacht in russia in 1941 and 42 is a case in point where yeah. their tanks are arguably not up to the standard of their enemies but they're they're outperforming them all the time purely because of how they're used uh, and the doctrine behind them and and again this is if you like the final version this was this monster known as as uh, boy in the red army which is the killer beast um, equipped with them with the 152 mil howitzer um, and although it only carried about 20 rounds within it um, the high explosive shell from these had enough of a concussive effect on impact to disable um, anything it hit so if it if you even if you were in a king tiger if the, if this thing landed a shell on you there was a good chance it was certainly going to knock your gun out of alignment and quite possibly uh, silence your engine just with a shock wave um but that worked both ways the recoil of these things was substantial enough to um uh, enough to sometimes uh, stall the engine of the uh, of the wow uh, and 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 quite often enough after about four or five rounds um Actually, you were firing almost over open sights because the gun, the gun was no longer aligned uh, with its sights. Um, so, yeah, very impressive vehicle. Um, Germans didn't like it for very obvious reasons. It had fairly substantial armor, um, but you're getting a, you're you're testing the limits of technology. And interestingly enough. Um, the two heavy tank destroyer battalions that were equipped with Yad Tigers reported very similar problems, that uh, after a few shots, the gun sights needed realigning and the shock from the recoil was often quite damaging. So it was a it was a common feature. I think you're sort of reaching the limit of the self-propelled gun design by then uh, with these monstrous guns on these vehicles. Yeah. And then we will. Uh, there's people on the sidebar talking about. We're going to talk about ammunition and heat ammunition yeah. later on. You've got, but we're, we're going to get, now go from the biggest to the biggest. We're going to kind of go back to the the smaller side of things again. So we're going to yeah, go so back, back back in size. Yeah. So let's whiz through these. Um, Two light tanks really built during the war. Um, this is a T60. Um, Six thousand of these built up to 1943. Um, this is, if you like, almost like a Panzer II. It weighs in at only six tons, and it has a maximum of 20 mil armor. It has a 20 mil gun and a machine gun. The Germans used a few captured ones of these, either as command tanks or, or as reconnaissance tanks. And that's really their main role, their reconnaissance, their cavalry, um, if you like, their hussars in armor. Um, mm. But they built about 6,000 of these like I say, when they were used in mixed formations, they were of limited use because they tended to get to places early and were pretty much <laughs> yes, by, by the time the bigger boys arrived. Um, they were then replaced by the extraordinary T-70, um, which had a couple of odd innovations. First of all, the turret was not centrally mounted. It was offset to one side, um, which made it almost unique. It weighed Again, only nine tons. It's not a. It's not a big tank. Um, it had a forty-five, the, the same forty-five mil gun as some of the other uh, Soviet tanks. Armor was better. It got up to about sixty mils. 
But bizarrely, it was powered by two engines, one for each set of tracks. And the layout of these engines was changed partway through in order to try to make it more reliable. But I'm not aware of any other tank that went for that sort of approach. Um, built in very large numbers, um, over 8,000 built by 1943. Thereafter, the Red Army stops making light tanks because it's just got so many T-34s and it's just going for those instead on the grounds of let's just have everything turning up at the same time. That way you can switch crews from one to the other with less problem. And, you know, th those are our preferred tanks. Yeah, no, it's it, there's some fascinating designs there, certainly. But right early on, I have to tell you, Prit, where people were asking about the Russians' development of, of, of ammunition, because that's poorly the area where they are taking things maybe further than other nations so you've sent us some diagrams of some of the cross sections of different bits so 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 what what do they do that's different to everybody else and when were they doing it well they were doing it in parallel with what everybody else was doing one of the things that the red army or, or the soviet designers claimed to have innovated though i think germans would probably argue about that was that they went from the idea of a solid armor piercing shot to having one with a copper cap on the front. And the purpose of the cap was that it would deform on impact. This was designed specifically to stop the round bouncing off sloping armor. And it would, and the uh, the the heavyweight um, hardened steel or tungsten projectile behind the copper cap would then apply its force in a more perpendicular manner um, to the armor. The Germans had claimed that they thought of that too, um, but uh, the, the Red Army claimed to inv have invented the idea. The um, standard anti-tank round of the Germans in 1939 was the one on the left here, which does include a, does include a small explosive charge. So this isn't just a penetrative weapon. It has a small explosive in order to increase fragmentation. And the idea is that once it's, um, uh, it has a slight delay um, fuse so that when it hits uh, the target, the fuse is triggered, and a fraction of a second later, this explosive charge goes off, by which time, hopefully, the round is inside the tank for maximum effect. The Red Army didn't really go for that, and it just designed solid rounds that would punch through armour, um, and then relied on the fact that the round would have lost so much kinetic energy breaking through armour that it was un was unlikely to punch out the other side, and instead was going to ricochet around inside and hit all manner of vulnerable targets, crew, ammunition engine whatever um, the germans moved on to the uh, panzergranate uh, 40 on the right here um, this replaced um, the uh, 1939 round uh, to a large extent and this did away with the explosive charge so the central core of this the bullet shaped bit in the middle of this um, is made of tungsten steel it has uh, an aerodynamic cap, which uh, often had a, a copper mix in order to allow it to penetrate uh, sloping armor better. Um, as the war went on and uh, Germany started running out of tungsten, uh, these were replaced with a variety of different steel alloys. And certainly by the second half of 1944, you have anti-tank gunners and tank crews complaining that rounds are disintegrating on impact. They're just not hard enough to penetrate armor. Some of that may reflect that actually by then, um, the Soviet uh, uh, designers were producing better armor themselves and they were better surface, they were better case hardened and better surface hardened. Um, but certainly the lack of tungsten was making itself felt. Um, the Germans also went for this idea of what's called the Gerlich principle, and this is this odd, odd round with these little flanges on the left. Um, and this fitted a, a tapered bore weapon where um, the, the final uh, aperture of the barrel was slightly smaller than the beginning aperture, and the result was the round actually uh, achieved a much higher muzzle velocity, and that gives you higher kinetic energy and therefore more penetrative power. The price is a much lower uh, barrel life. A 75 mil gun firing this sort of ammunition um, was going to burn out after about 800 to 1,000 rounds, as opposed to 6,000 rounds of conventional ammunition. Mm. Now, by the time you're getting into 1943-44, you're not often going to have a 75 mil gun that's going to survive long enough for that to matter. So it becomes less of an issue. 
Um, but the Germans uh, or the British were the ones who uh, really went the route with things like uh, APDS rounds. And although the Germans adopted them and the Red Army adopted them, not least because they were getting them via Lend-Lease, um, that wasn't necessarily an innovation that came from within the, the Soviet Union. Um, both the Soviet Union and uh, the Wehrmacht started experimenting with high explosive anti-tank rounds, as you can see on the right here, at roughly the same time. And the Germans got these into uh, frontline uh, activities sooner. And this is the uh, this is a shaped charge uh, concept where um, you have an explosive round. This is a bit like applying, if you like, um, if you pack the inside of a baked bean tin with explosive and then drill out at the center of it and apply the, the, the baked bean tin to the side of your target with the open face facing the, the target, you then ignite the explosive. Um, you, the penetration is done by creating a very hot plasma jet that will punch through the armor and, and spray molten metal into the interior of the tank. Um, the velocity of impact no longer matters. You're not relying on kinetic energy uh, to hit. So these tended to be, be low velocity weapons. Um, that made them somewhat less accurate. So they tended to be short range. Um, and quite often you had fuse failure because of course a fuse has to go off uh, for them to be any use. But as the next slide shows, Actually, the velocity mattered so little that they designed weapons that you could just stick on the side of a tank and just trigger yeah. the, uh, the detonator and it would then do its thing. And of course, the Panzerfaust and Panzerschreck used this sort of ammunition to great effect. Um, and this then leads to the development of uh, spaced armor and armored skirts in order to detonate incoming uh, heat rounds uh, before they hit the main body armor of a tank. Um, and ultimately, these remain a very, very potent anti-tank weapon right up into the 1970s until the advent of composite armor, Chobham armor, as it's known to the British, uh, where you basically have a steel ceramic steel sandwich and the ceramic uh, will then dissipate the inward jet of molten gas created by a heat round uh, so that it doesn't punch all the way through the armor. Um, but generally, you know, the, there's always been this sort of arms race between how you're going to penetrate armor and how you're going to protect armor. And generally, by the time you, you, know, you get to 1945, they're still going for the solution of you're just going to use a bigger gun. You're going to use a bigger round where you can put more powder behind it to accelerate it faster. And you're going to rely on the kinetic energy of that round um, until the advent of heat rounds and in the West, the APDS rounds, which start to change the approach to this. So as we're going to bring things to an end fairly soon, I mean, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this, and so have the people watching it. But you know, you, you've you are you've studied the Russian campaign, Eastern Front, to a huge level. You've been to have many books you're doing now, new one coming out. What are your conclusions about how the Soviets addressed both the pre-war and then as the war went went on? Yeah, you know, what out of out of ten, what would you give them as a score for sort of keeping up with the? With the uh, the trends and the and the and the combat that they're facing, it's a very good question, and it's a very hard one to give you a straight answer to. Um, I think that uh, when you look at the structure of Soviet units, certainly coming out of the Second World War and into the early Cold War, the thing that they had learned was that purely infantry units um, have a very very limited use, and that even motor rifle divisions in the years that follow um, have an integrated uh, a tank regiment or tank battalions attached to them, uh, or they have self-propelled gun battalions to support them. Um, but the Germans never had the resources to do that, even if they wanted to do that. Um, throughout the Second World War, the Red Army had a very well-established routine of after-action reports, particularly at army and at front level. The, the interesting thing that I'm finding in my research is, uh, in fact, the conclude, one of the concluding chapters of my next book is going to be Lessons Imperfectly Learned. And it's about how, um, yeah, they, they, they would analyze their defeats or their successes, but then they would just do the same thing again because the conclusions they had drawn were not the correct ones. So it, it's a good example of you can have all of the um, uh, all, all of the ideas that you like about uh, how we're going to analyze stuff. But if you don't draw the right conclusions, they're pretty useless. Um, certainly, the uh, the Red Army was perhaps 
in the lead over the Germans in this whole idea of infantry going into action, riding tanks, and tanks being accompanied by uh, a, a, a section of troops armed with submachine guns to try to provide them with some infantry support. But that was largely an experience from the early attacks where the Germans were very, very good at using mortars and machine gun fire to strip infantry away from armor um, and allow the armor through for the Panzerjägers to deal with in the rear zones uh, while they held up the infantry. So this was a, th these were, if you like, innovations under pressure in order to, to try to find ways around this. And it should be remembered that certainly when you get into the, the Cold War era, um, you know, the West was talking about the need for a mechanized infantry combat vehicle, but was still toying around with them and not really coming up with it. And the and the Soviets beat us to the punch. They they fielded the BMP seventy six long before the Marder appeared in in the Bundeswehr. So they mm. continued this whole line of development for a very very long time. Yeah, I mean we discussed that in the first show that the, this perception by the wide wider world that the, the Russians or the Soviets just through volume and poor quality of everything and one simply by brute force it doesn't really bear out you know they they have they've put some some thought into it they they're pretty good with technology they they they're looking at what they can learn from their enemies they're looking at what they can learn from their allies i think you know as a as i'm not a, i'm not an eastern front guy but i can see that my learning particularly from reading your books and talking to you about what the Soviets and the Red Army are doing is, is extraordinary. I, I, I perhaps have misjudged them a little bit, as I'm sure some people watching this and kind of just group them into this, oh, well, it's just brute force and ignorance, and it's not that really the case at all. So um, we could come back and do another show sometime about about a, a particular town. We could do T-34. We could talk about a particular campaign. But right now, I'm going to bring things to an end and say this has been really, really fascinating listening to you, Prit. You are, you are a superstar. You know your stuff. Someone yeah. said earlier, I forget who it was now, if my if my GP was could talk like you, I'd be going to the doctor ill more often. And I think that, yeah, if I had a doctor that could talk about tanks, I'd be going in there for minor things all the time. And it, forget about my foot. Just tell, talk about tanks. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, that's great. So um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. So in terms of what we've got coming up, I say tomorrow we've got one more show of this tank week. Uh, Philip Brazier is going to talk about the 79th Armour Division and their cooperation with the engineers and the Shelt Estuary, and, and uh, that'll be good. And 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 Pritt is a, a – sorry, not Pritt. A, tomorrow Philip is, a, is an Army sergeant. He's an engineer. He's worked alongside tanks. He's a serving uh, – or has been a serving of, you know, sergeant, so he knows his stuff, and that'll be really interesting. But it remains me tonight to say thank you to Pritt for joining us. Um, as usual, folks, there are description uh, in the description below. There are links to some of Pritt's books. Not all of them. Otherwise, it would be a very, very long description. I recommend them. You'll learn an incredible amount about the Eastern Front from Pritt. It's a, it's a really easy to easy reading style, but you also you learn a lot as well. It's that perfect blend of information and readability. So they're, they're, they're fantastic. So um, thanks for joining us, Pritt. So as for everybody else, I will see you all again tomorrow for part five. And then I have the weekend off and then we're coming back. You may have seen on YouTube, I put the promo video up today for the amazing historians with comic coming up for the second half of April. We've got SOE shows. We've got Sobibor. We've got displacement camps. We've got a huge variety of subjects. I cannot wait to get to grips with that. And then in May, I've been working today on Resistance Week. We've got Strategic Bombing Week. There's lots more coming up. So don't go away. Keep telling people what we're doing on World War II TV. But as I say, check out Prince Books below. Um, and enjoy. I'll see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Woodadge and Prit Buttar saying thank you very much for watching. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>